Ooh, a little technicality. Uh, there we go. But first, a little bit about ourselves. Franco? So I'm Franco, and I love baking a cheesecake with my grandmother recipe. Certain? Yes, so actually one of the fun things about me is that I absolutely love the kite flying. So you know all the shapes of the kites and different maneuvers that we used to fly the kites. So that's one of my favorite things. And Dr. Singh? Uh, and myself, um, I'm a big DIY enthusiast. So I like to work with my hands and do a lot of projects around the house. So what exactly is the program representation? You may see that during each VMR from the clinical program solvers, the transcriber will ask the audience, what is your program representation for this case being discussed? So the program representation is a succinct process summary of a patient story, almost like a tweet, which aids in building a differential diagnosis. Kirtan will outline the next, next what defines the program representation. Kirtan? Sure. So now what are some of the key aspects of program representation? So there are three key aspects, the who part, the what part, and the when part. So the who part kind of focuses on the relevant epidemiology and the risk factors for the disease. And the what part, you know, kind of focuses on the differentiating features of the clinical syndrome. So what are the signs and symptoms of the disease, something along those lines. And finally, the when part. And the when part is also very important because we focus on the time course, the pattern of the disease and the tempo of the disease. And combining all these three things helps to move us ahead. Now that we have defined the program representation, we need to ask ourselves, why exactly is this important and what is its role in the diagnosis process? So the program representation will summarize the key data points taken during history and at the same time minimize distractors so that we can focus on the real problem that is at our hands. An effective program representation will aim to reduce cognitive load and help to facilitate the problem solving task. The program representation is also dynamic as we update it, it interactively as we gather more data through each page, page encounter in VMR each through each aliquot. For example, during the virtual morning report, each aliquot will bring more detail about the patient sign, symptoms, auxiliary findings, and will expand our program representation. The updated program representation should then facilitate our clinical reasoning by comparing and contrasting it with our own illness scripts to help to reach the number of potential diagnosis, diagnostic hypotheses. As we mix and match the program representation to each illness script, we should find someone that fits. Through this process, we should come upon a match and should efficiently help make the correct diagnosis. Yes, and now, you know, let's demonstrate this in action in real time with the help of a case. And we, you know, want everyone to be involved in this. So please, friends, share your problem representation with us in the chat. And even, you know, Dr. Singh will prompt us again and again at how you refine problem representation with each aliquot so that at the end of the case, we would, you know, kind of make a summary of all the problem representation. And we would see that how our problem representation was refined during the process and how we learned from it. Now, Dr. Singh. Mm -hmm. Okay, we now will stop sharing and launch the whiteboard and begin with the case. Just tell me when you're ready. Okay. So the case for today is a 79-year-old man presenting with syncope and left leg pain. So I'll start with Franco. So Franco, how would you start constructing a mental model for this patient's problem? Perfect. So I will start with what, with what Curtin said. Who, what, when? Who? An elderly man, 70-year-old man, with syncope and left leg pain. So I don't have with enough information right now to, to do the when, but can, I will suppose it's going to be between the acute or the hyperacute uh, uh, setting. Um, after that, the why is still really early to know why, but we can define syncope as a corner stone in the diagnosis process that Kirtan will going to tackle next. Excellent. So uh, Kirtan, taking Franco's early problem representation, could you show us how it will, how it will guide your clinical reasoning? Sure. So as Franco said that we have a 79-year-old male 
and you know we are still not clear about the time cost whether it is acute subacute or chronic but we can presume that maybe it's somewhere between acute and hyperacute so i was thinking that how we can guide this problem representation to build a differential diagnosis so again first and foremost i would make sure that we are not missing the must not diagnosis so whenever someone presents with syncope first and foremost things are you know could this be a stroke could this be a transient ischemic attack could this be something which is you know altering the perfusion to the brain itself and leading to the syncope so that's the one aspect of our pr and the other aspect is the leg pain now you know it's very nice to keep in mind that we should try to integrate them but first we should deal with them individually so what can cause leg pain so of course we would worry about is it some vascular cause because whenever we are worried about the acute presentation we should prioritize the vascular cause so is it dvt is it some you know vascular arterial issue or something like that is it cellulitis what could it be so those are some of the things that we would keep in mind and as we get more data we would try to integrate them Brilliant, brilliant. So at this point, we have a limited amount of data to mine and refine into a problem representation, as uh, Franco and Kirtan have eloquently put together. And as we obtain more data, I will be giving you more points uh, along the course with this with this case. We can then expand the material. So everybody get involved and type in the chat what you think your problem representation will be. And again, focus on who, what, and when. And using these categories, we should be able to build somewhat of a problem representation. So on to the next aliquot. So this 79-year-old man with a history of coronary artery disease and single vessel bypass grafting surgery, and I'll slow it down for the scribe, uh, back in 1991 for LAD stenosis, and then had a stent placed 10 years ago, also in the left main. Also has a history of obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, and now is coming in with leg pain after a syncopal episode um, resulting from a fall. Prior to this episode, he had some lightheadedness and did have a forewarning that he would fall and called out to his wife. There was about two minutes of loss of consciousness and no previous episode of this before. Prior to this, he had dyspnea for one week and denies chest pain, but he's been taking analgesic medicines such as a narcotic and has been increasing the amount or frequency to numb any pain or discomfort that he has. Okay, we'll stop there. Now I'll ask Kirtan. So, so Kirtan, can you lead us through what your what you think is our updated problem rep representation now that we have a few more data points? Sure. So now we have you know substantial amount of data to guide us. So firstly, we have to understand that what are some of the key aspects that we would use to build the PR. So in our case, we can find that we have a prodrome of lightheadedness before this episode. So that is one key component that we should involve because it can guide our differential. Then we should also involve that now we have a new symptom, which is the dyspnea that has been going on for one week. So that is something we should include. Apart from that, in the past medical history, something that really catches our eye is the fact that patient has classic atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and the patient even had stenosis. So that is something we could involve and even obstructive sleep apnea because if you see like that, then OSA is along the spectrum of ASCVD only because it also promotes the atherosclerosis and all the cardiovascular morbidity. So those are the key components that we would involve. So now how is our refined PR looking like? So I would go like this. We have a 79 year old male who is presenting with the synco and left leg pain following a prodrome of lightheadedness, subacute dyspnea for one week and past medical history significant for coronary artery disease status post uh, that stand placement and obstructive sleep apnea. So that's my problem representation as of now. The fact that he has been using narcotic medications is also something that we should consider. But as of now, I would see that how Franco kind of, you know, builds upon it. And then we can see if we should involve it in our next PR or not. Awesome. Awesome. I just want to stop there and uh, take a look at the chat. And I see Hans is uh put in a great problem representation, 79-year-old male with a past medical history of stent placement and OSA and restless leg syndrome presenting with syncope and leg pain. So that's absolutely what we, we are um, agreeing with over here. Now, um, 
Great job, Keaton. We're taking that problem representation. As you mentioned, there are a few key points that we can highlight. Now, Franco, now take those highlighted points from the problem representation, and can you show us how you would uh, leapfrog into a possible hypothesis or differential? Great. So I think that both the problem representation, the one who is in the whiteboard and the ones that are typing in the chat are amazing because all of those tackle and immediately recall for an illness script. So if we see an elderly patient with syncope, we have to think that syncope is a transient loss of blood pressure. And then we can fill it up what can make the blood pressure go lower. So we have the vascular resistance or we have the cardiac output. So in this case, we are going to took all the things that are in the problem representation and we find out that this patient has cardiovascular risk factors. And that definitely points out if there is a problem with the peripheral uh, vasculature or if there is a problem with the heart itself. But there is an important thing in the problem representation that guide me through this process is the dyspnea. The subacute period of dyspnea definitely points out if that probably this is a problem with the heart itself. So it's the cardiac output. So probably this patient is going to, the likelihood of this patient of having a cardiovascular problem probably in the heart is really, really, really going high as soon as we gather more data. But I will also take in account what Kirtan say about the drugs. We have to take that in the background. Maybe it is a problem with the medication that is following this and the heart is okay. And also something that I want to point out is that the leg pain can be a distractor here or can be something that is the consequence of this whole problem because this patient has leg pain after the syncope. So we can assume that it probably got a hit when he fell during the syncope episode, or maybe something that caused that is like a thrombose that is in the leg pain that, that was uh, like not apparent before the syncope and is taking apparent, more apparently now that there is a trauma there. I think that that would be my diagnosis process with this problem representation so far. Fantastic, Franco. That was absolutely great, uh, amazing. I'm, I'm going to ask a few if a few volunteers are able to unmute their mic if they're in a safe space and and share with us their problem representation. Uh, Val, you have a have a great rep problem representation up in the chat box. Are you able to to elaborate on it for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's a 79 year old male with cardiovascular risk presenting with sudden loss of consciousness and leg pain preceded by lightheadedness and one week history of dyspnea. Awesome, awesome. I'm also going to ask Jane, uh, who's also typed a wonderful problem representation in the chat box. Are you able to unmute your mic and also uh, elaborate on your problem representation? Yeah, sure. Um, I think mine is a little longer than the others, but um, I just wanted to um, I think for me, I just wanted to include everything that I thought might be relevant. Um, so yeah, so just to kind of review what I wrote, I wrote 79 year old male with history of CAD status post um, LAD bypass grafting, left main stent OSA and restless leg syndrome presenting with syncope and leg pain in setting of a one week history of dyspnea and regular narcotic um, analgesic use. And I think at this point, kind of all of these clues could potentially be contributory. So I included them in the, in my problem representation. Absolutely wonderful. And, and I absolutely agree as we focus in and obtain more data, we will refine and define this further, uh, hoping to, to then um, focus on what may be the problem as, at hand, like Frank had mentioned. Uh, so we'll move on um, from each of these problem representation. I could take any one. They're not they're all actually different interpretations, but they're all actually agreeing on, uh, like Franco mentioned, the dyspnea and a few key words that may actually stand out, what we call buzzwords, and reflexively may uh, point us towards a few emergency diagnoses, but I'll leave that to Franco and Keith to elaborate on. So Aliquaf 3, um, medication, a few other medications, patient is on aspirin, pravastatin, Losartan and dilaudid. Um, no, no significant uh, behavioral issues, social history, or family issues. So we'll leave those boxes normal. I mean, um, blank allergies, none. 
onto the vital signs. So temperature 36.3, heart rate is 70, blood pressure 131 over 50, and pulse ox 100% on two liters nasal cannula. And remarkable physical exam findings, neck, no obvious JVD. The body habitus was not allowing us to examine the neck. Cardiovascular heart sounds were distant. Again, patient has a large BMI. And there is chronic lower extremity edema. And then respiratory, also limited by the patient's body habitus. No wheezing, crackles, or ronchi heard. And we'll stop there. And I'll ask Franco, now at this point, We've got a few more interesting points that we can integrate into our problem representation. Could you now formulate what will be your latest and updated problem representation? Perfect. So uh, I will copy and paste the problem representation of Alico 2, but I will add, I will work on that and probably include that this patient is obese, 20 year male, obese male. And I will also incorporate the chronic edema after uh, pressing with leg, painful, you know, problem with right head and so keep this for a week and chronic left, chronic lower extremity edema. That way we can use, I think it's going to be helpful for Kirtan to tackle the tempos of this problem representation. Awesome points. Uh, absolutely love it. And um, Kirtan, now taking uh, Franco's latest and greatest problem representation, can you now springboard into now formulating uh, your hypothesis and narrowing down to what may be going on with the patient? Yeah, so you know, Franco has laid down an amazing framework for me to work upon. So to recapitulate what Franco just said, that we have a 79 year old obese man. So you know, that is the new part that we have now involved. And what is another new thing that apart from the coronary artery disease, we now have evidence that the patient had chronic lower extremity edema. Now, one way to you know, link all of them is that patient is just obese and maybe due to body habitus, the patient has all that sort of congestion and that's why the patient has lower extremity edema. But another way to look at it is that maybe you know, the patient has obstructive sleep apnea and that has led to the pulmonary hypertension and you know, that is leading to the heart failure and that is causing the lower extremity edema because of the congestion. Now, the JVP was not elevated, but as Dr. Singh you know, kind of emphasized, and it was difficult because of the body habitus. So maybe the patient has elevated JVP and we just don't know. The BP seems fine, but that doesn't mean that patient's ejection fraction is fine. We still need an echocardiography to make sure that the patient's heart is beating well or not. And in this case, I would also make sure to get the carotid atherosclerosis so as to ensure that there is no evidence of you know, stroke or some sort of stenosis, which might be leading to this thing. And another interesting thing, which you know, while Franco was filming the PR, it entered in my mind, that if someone has chronic stasis in the lower extremities, then it is the classic, you know, kind of bedrock for development of thrombus. So I would also make sure to get a Doppler of the lower extremities because it is always possible that maybe the patient has a pulmonary embolism, which is, you know, somehow causing this dyspnea and all these vague symptoms, and we are not able to figure it out. The fact that patient is still stable, kind of, you know, make sure that it is not a massive P because if it is indeed was a massive pulmonary embolism and the patient would be unstable. So right now I am reassured that patient is not unstable so that I can still go ahead and do all these tests so as to move further towards the diagnosis. Absolutely wonderful. So I really love the way you've taken now this problem representation and then uh, highlighted certain points which trigger thoughts what may be going on. Uh, as we have increased the complexity of the case, uh, there's a lot more things to consider and we have to become very organized and very analytical in this process, and you've uh, demonstrated a very pragmatic approach to this process. So sometimes in VMR, we're very quick 
with our thoughts and we jump to conclusions. But this is a very organized and very delicate process, which we're trying to sort of tease out here. Uh, I'm going to ask on uh, another actually uh, CPS Bootcamp member, Promise, who's also joined us and has a, has a great problem representation. Are you in a safe space to unmute your mic and share with us your, your fa fabulous problem representation? I was actually just typing the update, <laughs> but sure. So what I had was a 79 year old male with significant, um, or actually now with the update, one, I would say 79 year old obese male with significant cardiopulmonary past medical history presents with syncope and uh, left leg pain following a lightheadedness and dyspnea for one week. And then a physical exam shows a chronic left lower extremity edema. Um, and that would be it for now. Great. Sorry to put you on the spot there, but uh, that, that was really fantastic. And and as you mentioned before, this is a great skill, which we'll elaborate on further, how it can be very useful in your in your clinical rotations. And I also want to call on our friend Shema, uh, typed a, a very nice, uh, extensive problem representation. Are you also able to unmute your mic and uh, share with us your great thoughts? Sure. I, I actually added only some uh, two uh, facts into the uh, aliquot tree problem representation. I would add that this patient also has obstructive sleep apnea. I'm sorry. Again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, just a moment. Yes, I added obstructive sleep, uh, sleep apnea, and also instead of um, syncope, I would also write loss of consciousness. As uh, Val already mentioned, is it really a syncope or is it a mimic? Absolutely wonderful. And, uh, these are the problems with Zoom, so it's a uh, it's always a fun process. Uh, it's it's in real time, so anything can happen. So we'll move on to the next aliquot. We have some laboratory data. So sodium was 139, potassium 4.4, chloride 105, bicarb 22, BUN 52, creatinine 1.89, and it was 0.79 a few weeks back. And ALP 162, AST 55, ALT 59. We'll circle back to the CBC white count 9.72, hemoglobin 12.2. Platelets 138. And uh, we have some imaging, which I'll add. CT head was normal. X ray left leg fractures of distal fibula and medial malleolus. Chest x ray mild congestion, cardiomegaly, and signs of previous cardiac surgery. And after this, we will have a, a scene play out with patient um, having an, uh, an episode which may help you lead or help lead you to the diagnosis. So we'll stop here. And at this point, I'll um, ask... Uh, Kirtan, uh, if you can elaborate on a uh, updated problem representation to help us then point us in the right direction or what you think may be in the, the right direction. Sure. Yes. So, you know, at this point in time, I wanted to emphasize one point which I had learned from peers who MS, that problem representation is basically a reflection of our illness scripts and of our diagnostic hypothesis. So, like whenever we frame the PR, it's not just that we are passively involved in the data. 
we are you know kind of thinking along the lines of possible diagnosis and then involving the meaningful data so in our case if you see to the left findings then you can see that the platelet counts are a bit low now it could be low for numerous reasons maybe it, it it is not even significant but still it is low and it is kind of going along with one possible diagnosis which i would allude to later and maybe one franco would allude to it but i would keep that in my mind another thing the patient has rise in the creatinine levels and you know this could be considered as an acute rise because it has been only like few days and with acute rise in creatinine we always have to worry about some acute kidney injury and things like that so that is another important point to involve in pr and finally the imaging studies that if you remember that in the very first aliquot itself franco kind of reminded us that maybe the patient has leg pain due to some complications of the trauma itself so you know this is a reminder that how our initial diagnostic hypothesis is kind of shaping our pr so now for the updated pr i would say that we have a 79 year old obese male with past medical history of coronary artery disease presenting with the loss of consciousness leg pain subacute dyspnea with evidence of low platelets subacute rise in the creatinine and fracture of the lower extremity and i am sure that this would help franco to guide us further in the differential diagnosis journey awesome updated uh, problem representation and we're hanging on every word which will help uh, us to to uh, move with you and springboard into a a um, hypothesis that franco will elaborate on but before we get to that i also want to ask if if daniela can uh, unmute her mic if she's in a safe space and uh, share with us her updated problem representation hi um so i was just thinking about this now uh, i i'm not exactly sure how i will go with this um i think it would be relevant to highlight um the findings on laboratory exams so uh platelets and creatinine are standing out to me they are highlighted i believe the rest is currently normal um and the the chest x-ray and the x-ray of the leg um I think would also be important to highlight. Uh, in the back of my mind, I'm not sure if this is the right path or not, uh, but I'm trying to think of something that could present with all of this. And I was thinking all along something along the lines of thrombus or what could cause this loss of consciousness and the leg pain and Whenever we see chronic uh, lower extremity edema, I think it's always in my mind the possibility of thrombosis. Um, so I would guess uh, for this aliquot, we could consider uh, elderly men uh, presenting with syncope um, and um, Laugh like pain. Um, let me see. I think I would add, actually add to my last one. So, um, and subacute dyspnea for one week, past medical history relevant for cardiovascular risks, um, such as large BMI, um, CAD, and stenosis with stent placement. Osphid co examination presents with chronic um, lower extremity edema and with um for i think comp um i'm not sure how you say um uh, exams are complement the <laughs> physical exam in english uh but laboratory relevant for like um throm thrombostopenia is that or Oh yeah, okay. Uh, elevated creatinine baseline zero point um seventy nine um, and on chest X ray signs of congestion and cardiomegaly and leg fractures. I think that would lead to further my possibility of thrombosis. 
Awesome. Thank you, Daniela. Yeah, there's a lot lot of things now. I, I looked at your fabulous PR in the chat box, and then you just sort of in real time have added to it uh, this latest information. So sometimes it's not a very simplistic process, but uh, with repetition, this is something that we as beginners in clinical reasoning should be doing, and you just highlighted how to do it in real time. So appreciate your, your contribution there. I want to ask Franco now to take uh, Daniela's and Kirtan's uh, problem representation now springboard into what you think. Uh, so focus in on the senior features, what may be going on with this patient. Perfect, perfect. So I think for the diagnosis process here, the what the when in the problem representation is going to be key because we are dealing with two wings. This patient has a subacute dyspnea plus chronic leg lower extremity edema and has a coronary artery disease in the previous medical history. So maybe this patient has heart failure and it is uncompensated heart failure that lead to a syncopal, syncopal episode and then fell. That is the second why, the second when, then fell, started the pain and with the pain, she could, he could develop a uh, fat embolism that is characterized with low platelets, syncope, and it will be, uh, and the fracture that is there, it, although it's not a, a large enough bone, but could be also a possibility. I think that Kirtan was heading in that way when she when he put the low platelets and, that's, and that key features in the prior representation. But it is, like we are heading that like this is a heart failure picture that developing and regular uh, and regular thrombus like uh, like uh, lower uh, like uh, thrombi that went and caused a pulmonary embolism or maybe the patient has also a heart defect that can cause a, a irregular thrombi to go from the leg leg and start go into the central nervous system. The head seat is normal, but we should maybe could see that in the long after time, it not, it's not normally that nor, the first head CT is quite normal. We should be doing a follow-up there. But we are talking between those diagnoses. And the heart failure setting is kind of important here because there is a elevation of the creatinine, dyspnea on a patient with cardiovascular risk factors, and the syncope episode. So I think we are heading in that direction. And a cardiogram will be really helpful here. Absolutely there. So I'm going to now portray a scene. You, you've all had wonderful thoughts there and you're right on the spot with uh, a lot of the thoughts that I think the team went through with this case. Um, so this patient was then seen by orthopedics and uh, they did request medicine to do a preoperative eval. Uh, medicine went to see the patient and the patient was mentioning a great deal more shortness of breath. Blood pressure at that time, 88 over 50. Respiratory rate, 24. Afebrile, and for the blood pressure, intravenous fluids were started. Lactate was normal. Now I'm going to ask Franco with this latest amount, uh, this latest data, now re refine, elaborate, go through the process of updating the, the problem representation. Okay, so this prior representation is definitely going to change in contrast with all the before prior representation because we have a hyperacute process here. So it is a 70 year old male, hospitalized man, who develops hyperacute worsening of shortness of breath, low blood pressure. We can put shock instead of that. And then we should incorporate the history of previous uh, LOC and the fractures and the history of uh, leg, lower left leg fractures. And I think that the coronary disease, we can put it aside for a moment. So it will be a 70 year old hospitalized man in, well, inpatient, a 70 year old male inpatient who developed hyperacute worsening, shortness of breath, lower blood pressure, and high respiratory rate. With previous medical history of recent LOC,
and left leg fractures. Okay, um, great. Thanks, thanks, uh, um, Franco. Uh, I'll, I'll, I guess we'll take that problem representation, and now move to Kirtan to see what thoughts that may trigger, and also take us along your the journey of your thought process in linking all your thoughts together to this problem representation, if you don't mind. Sure. So you know, I wanted to you know thank Franco for this PR because if you see that you know Franco is taking his time to. Frame the PR. So that is what we want when we are creating the PR that we are, you know, analyzing the data that we have and making sure that only the right data is making it to the PR. And we are kind of constantly modifying the PR as Franco I did that it's a dynamic process. So I really love that what Franco did. And now we have a recently hospitalized man. So you know, the frame of thinking has already shifted. And now we are dealing with the hyper acute process, which is already happening on the background of the patient having loss of consciousness, dyspnea, coronary artery disease, you know, sleep apnea fracture and all those things are going in the background, but now we have hyper acute things at our hand. So what it could be, so you know the four plus two plus two schema that we always use, but remember that it is for the chest pain, but patient is on so many analgesics. So it, it may happen that patient will not complain of chest pain. So we have to keep in mind all these tiny things when we are framing our differential. So what are first and foremost things that we need to get? We need an ECG to make sure that this is not an acute coronary syndrome. This is not aortic dissection. We also need troponin levels to make sure that dissection or heart failure is not a cause of some infarction because that is must not miss thing. What thing else can come to our mind? So pulmonary embolism and pneumothorax are two other possibilities. The fact that we have a tachypnea is now pointing towards that. And as Franco was pointing to us in the previous helicopter, that you know left lower leg fracture can be taken in the two forms. That one way to link everything together is the fat embolism. That we have lower extremity fracture, we have thrombocytopenia because you know the fat emboli will kind of capture all the platelets on its surface and those emboli will travel to the pulmonary vasculature, will cause the dyspnea and will also cause the cerebral findings. But you know we should also understand the base rate of the disease. So if you think about it, that if patient has chronic lower extremity edema, so there is stasis and on top of that if you develop the fracture then it will lead to you know localized inflammation localized hypercoagulable state. So that could cause run of the mill embolism and not the fat embolism. And even that embolism has now, you know, kind of drafted into the subacute to chronic pulmonary embolism kind of thing. And now we are getting into the final phase of the pulmonary embolism, which is the shock phase. So maybe this is some sort of obstructive shock. And that's why I agree with the chat that we need immediate CT pulmonary angiography and echocardiography to make sure that we are not dealing with a massive embolism, which is causing this shock. And you know, one another tiny thing I wanted to mention that how to think about the creatinine levels. So, you know, as Dr. Singh was alluding that we should stick to the basics. So if you think about the BUN creatinine ratio, then it's pointing towards the pre-renal etiology. And it kind of, you know, makes sense in our case. The patient is hospitalized, the patient has chest pain, the patient has shock and everything. So maybe just because of inadequate renal perfusion, we are getting the bump in the creatinine levels and we should see whether creatinine levels are responding to the IV fluids. And if it is not responding, then we should think about the other etiologies, which could cause the renal injury rather than the pre renal injury. So as of now, those are more, uh, you know, those are some of the things that comes to mind. And we should definitely get eco and geography and ECG, and let's see how we can move on. Okay, fantastic. I think I uh, didn't initially tell you about the EKG. I tapped in the chat. Sinus tachycardia, low voltage, no uh, remarkable findings. So it's very difficult with the large BMI to determine cardiovascular exam. EKG, you'll have low voltage criteria due, due to the leads being placed further away from the heart. Uh, other causes for low voltage criteria, COPD, pericardial effusion, um, uh, obesity can be also be a cause. Pneumothorax actually could also cause that, uh, any air interface between the leads and the, and the heart. So uh, it was difficult to take the patient immediately down for a CT, especially with the cranium being elevated. So VQ scan was emergently ordered. Echo was able to be done at the bedside and it showed a large pericardial effusion measuring 1.8 centimeters posteriorly. And also there was a dilated IVC. A patient was taken for pericardiosynthesis and 500 mLs of dark blood was aspirated. So um, now with this final diagnosis of pericardial effusion uh, hinging on uh, cardiac tamponade, what uh, I would like, like to invite Kirtan and Franco to reflect on the clinical reasoning process, integrating your 
uh, problem representations and how it helped you to lead to the thought of, say, we need to do CT uh, PE, we need to do a uh, echo, because I think the team in this case was just a su surprise. Uh, PE was at the top of the differential, but like Ethan mentioned, the four plus two plus two, and who knows, he may have had chest pain, but it was numbed by him taking the analgesic medication. So I'll start with Franco. Um, any reflections about the journey that you've led us through making the PR and then refining your diagnosis? Well, I think that the main thing is that the PR is dynamic. The PR change can change between one result to another and can shift your way of thinking. So I think that this particular case helped a lot to understand that process. We should start with the first aliquot and then see how it evolved during all the aliquots. And I think that after Kirtan and I remarks, we could do a final program presentation that could tackle this, this, uh, this pericardial effusion uh, process. And I think that it is important to always alternate between why, when, who, in order to, and what, in order to tackle down the program presentation really well. I think that that's the main thing to, to follow up here. Kirtan? Yes. So, you know, I just wanted to highlight one important point that what is the aim of problem representation? The aim is not to get to the right diagnosis immediately because sometimes, you know, in medicine, there are atypical presentations which may not present in a typical way and which we may not fit in our PR. But the PR, you know, kind of prompted us to the right diagnostic step. And this is something which I have learned from numerous VMRs that we may have something else in mind. As you know, Dr. Singh told us that pulmonary embolism was everyone's in everyone's mind. Like in the chat, we were thinking about pulmonary embolism only. But why we are thinking about pulmonary embolism? Because the problem representation was kind of guiding us towards that. The diagnostic step for that echocardiogram was, you know, actually led to the final diagnosis. So although in this case, because of the atypical presentation, we may not have figured out the uh, cardiac tamponade initially, but since you ordered the right diagnostic step, we are able to help the patient. So I think that is really important that how our PR kind of shaped our differentials and led to the right interventions for the patients. So that's my reflection. And, you know, I wanted to thank everyone for sharing their thoughts and the diagnostic procedures in the chat as well. And it was really cool. Now, Dr. Singh. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's no winner. There's no loser. What you actually did get to, and I really give you kudos for is ordering the necessary test and the team when presenting this case, went through the same motions and were flabbergasted when they found a pericardial effusion. And I think Hans is asking what caused it. I don't have that. Unfortunately, I don't have that information. Uh, but uh, uh, the clinical reasoning here has led you through, especially when yesterday Robbie mentioned, when you have the problem representation, you have all this data going on, just stop and look up and look at what the problem representation is, and it will help you refocus on what's going on. Because a couple, sometimes we may become very scatterbrained in this process, but then we may have to stop, uh, just huddle around this problem representation and reorganize our thoughts. So uh, I, I, I really do uh, applaud both of you, Keith and Franco, and uh, the, the crowd also for participating in making this. I just want to focus or highlight on the clinical uh, part of this. Like, why is this problem representation very important? Uh, number one, like we've showed here, it can facilitate clinical reasoning. But however, when you sit down and you write your notes or you give an oral presentation, this is very important because it's a way we can communicate to each other about this patient. So the last line that we would put on this patient's problem representation or the last updated one will be a patient has a diagnosis of pericardial effusion. Uh, etiology is unknown, but that's now the focus. Why is this patient having uh, a pericardial effusion. So um, this sentence that you craft is very important when you make an assessment plan. Uh, in your notes, the last part is what is going on with the patient and what is your plan for the patient. So this one line or a summary statement, assessment, or final problem representation will help guide you in trying to understand what, what is going on with the patient. And it's a, it's a good way as um, uh, it, it can be a backbone for how clinicians can communicate with each other uh, especially with all the updated information that we uh, that we have, and uh, finally we'll go through the the teaching points, um, and uh, then um, we'll come to a conclusion for today's VMR. Thank you. Um, hello.
Hello, everyone. Thank you. And uh, this was a great um, VMR. And yeah, um, just like give me giving like a personal opinion. I think the problem of representation is really important. Sometimes when we are in a VMR and we get to the labs and we start thinking the labs like it's high, it's low. I kind of lost my thought like what was the beginning like what what led so having like all this process really helped me like here on VMRs and like on my when I'm studying and doing clinical case so talking about the teaching points I wrote here all again for just taking my head the who what when and why the who we go for the if it was male or female the age the Past, mask, past, mathematical, past medical history, the family and social history, the health behaviors, exposures, and the what, the physical exam, laboratory, imaging, pathology, and the when, the hyperacute, acute, subacute, and chronic, and why we can think about the mechanism of the disease. In this case, we saw some highlights like the syncope that is the transit transition low pressure that can be for vascular resistance, resist, resistance and cardiac output. So we can think about it, this is vascular or from the heart. And the dyspnea, we have causes like heart from the lung and some other causes like medication anemia. And the left band, we think about it, this is when the patient falls, the thrombus or the trauma. Um, the edema, can be caused by the ob obesity, congestion, obstruction, a pulmonary hypertension, and a thrombos. And in this case, we thought about the chest pain, the four plus two plus two. And the fat embolized can be with dyspnea, tachycardia, decreased platelets, and the most common cause can be a long bone fracture. So thank you everyone. And this was a great section. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a great Sunday. Bye.